All right, so we're finally on the invertibility of linear maps, okay? So warning that this lecture is gonna be fun, okay? At least, at least that's what I think, okay? So first let's start with definitions. Well, the video will be two vector spaces over a common field. We let T equals to L a linear map and we say that t is invertible if there is a, a linear map from w to v such that in composer t where you got the identity on v and this composition gives the identity on w so it's, it's really easy to draw that we go t from here i goes from here right so r of t so you go t you go r it gives you the identity, like gives you the same thing. And he composed R, so 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 we put this side, R, and go back T. It gives you the original thing, right? So basically, like the inverse function thing, right? So the inverse function, inverse function is also linear. We require it to be linear. So, so this gives the theorem that whenever the, this linear map is bijective and we have a function such that we have these properties, then R is linear, okay? So this means that whenever T is bijective, then T is invertible, okay? So the definition between, so this is the the definition of invertible is there exists a linear map such that these two are satisfied. And now this theorem tells us that as long as you're bijective, right, and you have you have these, then R is linear. So the inverse function is also linear. So this is easy to prove. We pick two elements. We pick the unique v1, v2, such that tv1 is w1, tv2 gives you w2. Now r on w1 should give you v1, and r on w2 should give you v2 by, by definition, right? We have this. Now, which means that r of w1 plus w2, which is tv1 plus tv2, right? And we use the linearity of t, which is R of T of V1 plus V2, which is V1 plus V2, because they're the identity map on V. But V1 and V2, they're equal to RW1 plus RW2. So we have the linearity of R. And the other property, I mean, the other definition is also easy to check. So here is a note that the inverse function is unique, right? So, uh, to prove this, so we just suppose there you have two inverses, right? Then we have R1 is equal to R1 composed with the identity map on W. Well, the identity map on W, which is by definition equal to this, because R2 is the inverse of T. And we use the composition property of function associativity, right? And this thing goes to VUI, IV, right? It's identity on V, well, it gives you R2 back. So R1 is equal to R2. So since the inverse is unique, we can denote this as the inverse of T. And we also have that if T is invertible, then dimension V and dimension W have the same dimension, provided that they're both finite dimensional. Okay, so as long as you're invertible, then these two dimensions must be the same. Well, this is easy to check, because if you're invertible, then it is surjective. So the rank T is equal to dimension of W and nullity of T is equal to zero, which means that we have this, the dimension theorem. So this vanishes, we have dimension V is equal to dimension W. So now we consider a unilateral forward shift operator that is defined on a set of all bounded sequences. So it is of mapping that map to itself the domain and codomain are the same, and you take every sequence, you just shift it forward, kind of shift it forward, right? And if we define T be another map that takes this, and you shift it backwards, 
right? Then notice that if you shift it forward and you shift it back, it is the identity map. So T of S, so S is equal to the identity, which means that S is left invertible. But is S invertible in general, right? Well, if it's invertible, then must be a bijective, which means that you must be surjective, right? But you're clearly not surjective, right? Because S, because you cannot map to anything like one, one over two, one over three, right? You can't, because your first coordinate should always be zero. So any sequence start with like one, one over two, one over three, like this, it is not in the range of S. So S is not surjective. Okay, so here we have the proposition, which states that given two vector space over f, we have t being a linear uh, map, and provided that t is integrable, then dimension v is finite dimensional, and dimension w is finite, if and only if. And we have shown that their dimension agrees. We've shown this already. So if, if t is invertible, then this is finite means this is finite. Well, obviously, if v is infinite dimensional, the w is also infinite dimensional. Because, right, contrapositive. So this is easy to prove. Suppose that dimension v is finite. If it's finite, then we pick a basis, right? We pick a basis. Now. We just let wi denote the value of t mapped taken on each of the bi's for i from 1 to n. Well, since we know that range of t is equal to w, and for w, there's this v such that tv is equal to w, right? Because t is surjective. And we know that we have a linear combination representation of v. Now, which means that w is equal to tv is equal to all of those using the linearity of this, which is this. So each of the w is in the span of w1 to wn, right? So the space w is in contained in the span of this, which means that you have a finite generating set, right? Which means that if there's a subspace, I mean, there's a subset of this, which is the basis of w. So like dimension w must be finite. Right, it contains a basis for w. Now, for other way around, if dimension of w is finite, then we pick a basis of w and we do the same thing for the inverse of t. Right, it is by it is by symmetry. And now we seek for a formula for inverse. Right, because we have only shown that oh the inverse exists, then blah 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 blah. But how do we actually know when do we have the inverse? So this is going to be related to our knowledge on matrices. So we define a matrix, a square matrix is invertible if there exists another square matrix such that it gives you the identity matrix. And note that we remember this map, L of RT is equal to L of RT is equal to L of RT. Well, well, RT is equal to IN, right? But LIN is the identity map, right? And IN is equal to TR, right? Which is LT, uh, LR. So we have the com they commute, right? They commute. And second of all, like these two gives you the identity map, right? So we can show that if LT is in invertible, then T is invertible. Right. If L, right, can, if we can show that L T is invertible, then we can show that T is invertible. So we still want to show that, well, if this mapping is invertible, then if these two is equal to identity, which means that these two is equal to identity, but the identity is equal to these two. So these two must be equal. So here's the key for 
and vertibility of linear maps on finite dimensional vector spaces is we to determine its matrix with respect to some ordered basis and invertible. Right, so this is the key. So here is the precise statement. So we would have two vector spaces and both finite dimensional. And we have picked two ordered bases for V and W respectively, and we let T be a linear map. So now we say that we have that T is invertible if and only if its matrix with respect to the given ordered basis is invertible. And we have this formula. Okay, so this is our point. Determine its matrix with respect to some ordered basis invertible. To determine that the invertibility of linear math. So ultimately, the invertibility of a linear math transferred to the invertibility of a matrix. Right? So that's a that's a good point of view, and that explains why matrices are like a tools to represent linear maps and blah blah blah. Okay. So let's just start with this direction. Suppose that T is invertible, then we have their dimensions are the same because we're provided that they're finite dimensional. So we automatically have this thing. So T D C is a square matrix because they have the same dimensional, right? For its inverse, for its inverse, we have that T of T uh, inverse is equal to I W and T inverse of T is equal to I V, right? So we have, so with, with these two in mind, the identity map is the identity of, uh, identity matrix, I'm sorry. The identity matrix is identity of W with respect to this ordered basis, and IW is equal to this. In this, we have this matrix multiplication. And for IV, IW, we also have the same result for IV, right? So we can multiply it out. And notice that this, this, these two matrices, this times this gives you this, also this times this gives you this, which means that this matrix is the inverse matrix of this matrix. You see? And now, suppose that the matrix is invertible, right? Suppose this is invertible. We want to show that the linear map is invertible. This seems kind of a bit hard, but we can use our result earlier. Suppose the matrix is invertible. Say the inverse is B, right? Because if you're invertible, then you must be a square, ma square matrix. This is by definition. And B must be another uh, matrix, square matrix, such that its product gives you the identity matrix. And we know that right, they have the same dimension because you're a square matrix. Now, since we know that this map, it takes S to this basis, to this order basis, we know that this map, this map is linear bijection. Right, we proved this uh, in four. And now, if we let B equals to equals to some uh, uh, matrix representation of a linear map, because for any any matrices, for any matrix here, we can find a linear map that that under this map, right under this map, this is equal to some B, right? So we let b equal to this for some s and from the domain because it's bijection so it's surjective right okay so with that being said will we just do the same thing right for at the bottom it's not hard to check that and since we know that the identity on v and identity on w with respect to C is equal to the identity matrix. Okay, so um, so these with respect to D is equal to I N. Also, this with respect to D also gives you I N. Okay, so if we consider a map like V V, right D D, 
or it just d itself right then it is still bijection right so we can say that these two are equal these two functions are equal because they both map to i n and this mapping is injective because we know that it is bijective so it's all uh, is also injective right so from here we can conclude that we have this so as desired we have found a linear map s such that this and this okay so we show that t is invertible okay so you see matrices is a tool to understand linear maps right so we're we're very happy with this result right we got some progress and now let's move on well for any x y non empty set if f from x to y is a bijection then y is just this can be viewed as relabeled uh, relabeled by x but in general sets don't have algebraic structure but we have binary operation defined on vector spaces so because in general we don't have like algebraic structures on general sets but for vector spaces we have defined binary operations right vector addition and scalar multiplication so here we have a definition is that v and w is a vector space over field f we say that v is isomorphic to w with this notation if there exists an invertible linear map such that like uh, between them right? so if they can be related with the bijective linear map then t is an isomorphism between v and w okay and note that this isomorphic is an equivalence relation thank you for thank you bijection because you have such a good property right okay so here is the most exciting part v and w is a vector space so no matter you're finite or infinite right okay so here in this case we're like finite dimensional so for the finite dimensional case if you're isomorphic then you have the same dimension if you have the same dimension then you guys are isomorphic okay so this is a stunning fact right it is so cool let's just prove it first well for this direction well, we have isomorphism, then invertible, then we have the same dimension. So this direction is not hard. But for this direction, well, we just pick order basis, right? We let D equal to this, C equal to this. Well, because they're the same dimensions, so the length must all be N, right? N, N. And we know that there exists a unique linear map such that TVI is equal to WI for I go around N, right? Because for all the, for all the given set given bases and some given vectors there exists a unique linear map that takes these elements to those elements right this is proven in 5.1 which is lecture uh six or seven lecture on linear maps okay okay so recall from theorem one point one six from lecture six. So where is one lecture one point six? One point one six. Okay, here. So if we have finite dimensional, then injective surjective are equivalent. So if you can show that, if we can show that t is surjective, then we're done because if we show this, then we know this is true. Then we have t as bijective, right? So we just showed it as surjective, then we're done. Now for any W, we have as a basis, so we have a linear combination representation, and we know that T of this. So we're given some alpha i, and T act to act on this vector, which is this, which is this. So W, so there exists a vector that maps to, which is this, which is W. So T is surjective, so we're done. So we have proven the equivalence. So this means that for all finite dimensional vector spaces, they only differ by dimensions. Or 
do the same. Up to isomorphism. Okay, so they only differ by dimensions. If you so a vector space is like totally de defined, is totally determined by its dimension. Because for other, if you give a vector space v, if your dimension of v is equal to n, and for any other vector space dimensional, I mean vector space finite dimensional vector space w, well. If W is whole, uh, isomorphic, then they have the same dimension. If we have, if we have dimension W and dimension V are the same, then we know that uh, then we know that they are isomorphic. Right? So this is really cool, right? So all the finite dimensional vector spaces are only determined by their dimension. Right, because their dimension is the same, if only if, then we know that they're isomorphic. Okay, now, when you have more definitions, we'll be doing some diagram things, which is, which looks really fancy, but not hard. Okay, so what's given with a finite dimension of vector space V over F equal to F, D is an ordered basis, Okay, then the standard representation of V with respect to D. So we're given V, we're given D. Then we have a function over, uh, like a function that depends on V and D. So it is defined as rho D, that is a linear map from V to Fn. Okay, so dimension is N, so we map to Fn such that, such that for any X, it maps to its coordinate with respect to D. Okay, so rho d is an isomorphism. What well, is obviously linear, so, and also they have the same dimension. So we only need to show that it is surjective, once again, because think to this, the only equivalent, so if we show that it's surjective, then there's this, then they're bijective, right? Now, for any elements in Fn, we just let d, we just let D, the ordered basis, right, become this. Then we know that this is equal to this, by definition, right? So this, this thing is in V, right, this entire thing. So we're getting this. We provided the basis. Then we have this is equal to, then maps to this column vector, right, by definition. So it's surjective. Uh, back in lecture seven, lecture seven, I think we did something on the left multiplier operator, right? I think it's something somewhere, somewhere here. Yeah, this theorem, right? We have this proof. We have this property, and the proof I I, I modified a bit. I changed it a bit. So here's a new version of proof. Last time I proved it is like purely computational, which is not uh, that obvious. So here's a new proof. Okay, so we have to prove this result. Then, so we want to show that this coordinate is matrix multiplication. Well, for each u and v, we define f u to be f u of a gives a u. G u is G u of a gives a of T u. Okay. Now would that alpha one be the standard ordered basis f? So G u is equal to T v u, a T f u, for all u and all a. Right. Because this, it multiply you act T on this T a u, which is a T u, which this thing the same. And so T U C is G U one, right? Because one C. And what is one? Q 
coordinate of g u1 with respect to c is really just the matrix of g u with respect to alpha and c alpha is the one see so this is by the definition think deep about this think and g u is equal to tfu and we can expand the multiplication and now we use it like from here these two are equal right and f u1 well f, what is f u1 which is one u which is u right so which is gives you u okay all right so we prove this again so in light of this we have that we have the given the given condition and the map right this to this is an isomorphism right okay where's the original one original theorem i think is something wait matrices no wait yeah 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 we see that the map this to this is a linear bijection right so um it's so isomorphism and yeah we know this is isomorphism and dimension of vw is equal to dimension of this which is mn so dimension of linear map on vw is the multi the, the product of their dimension cool and also notice that when v is equal to w d is equal to c then we have this 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 which is this so it is multiplicative right the, mu the multiplication can pull it out so there's like some kind of like a ring homomorphism okay i haven't done much abstract algebra so i can't say much also here's a remark since we have that this is equal to this right so the standard representation then. so we have this is equal to this right so here's a diagram so from v to w we have t and from w to f m we have the standard representation right and also this and from fn to fm we have this matrix see okay so so this c of t x is equal to c of t x right which is t x c which is this times this right so this is like a matrix multiplication of this or this on x which is gives you this right so we have this equality gives this equality so we have here right so we have this diagram looks fancy right i know it looks so fancy so cool and so with a v and w vector spaces over there we suppose that your linear map and surjective we define this map so it's a quotient space from v to kernel t to w that maps each element to tx so we're given t we define this okay so here's a proposition so suppose it is surjective and we'll let pi be the like a quotient map and pi x gives you x plus kernel t then we have four properties so first it is well defined it's linear it's isomorphism and we have this which gives this diagram so from v to v current t we have the pi map from here to here we have t bar right but from v to w we can just apply t exactly so so we have this diagram right 
Okay, so just show that it is well defined. <coughs> Which means that for any same element from the space, from here we know that x minus y is in the kernel of t. So we have tx equal to ty. So which means that if they are equal, then their output on t bar. This gives you tx, but t is equal to ty. But ty is equal to this. So with the same input, you have the same output. So this map is well defined. It is well defined. And it must be linear. The linearity is kind of trivial. Right, just few lines, so I skip it. So for T bar B and isomorphism, well, we just show that it is first it is surjective and first it is injective. So why we just why can't we say that well it is sufficient to prove it's surjective? Because what we have is that we're given that their dimension are the same and they're finite. But here we didn't say anything about their dimension, right? It could be infinite dimension, right? It could be, right? V and W both infinite dimension. So this theorem, this, then this does not hold. Then how do we have this, right? We can't have it anymore. So we just prove it directly. We just prove it is surjective and it's injective. Then we're happy. So let's prove it's surjective for any W. So there is x such that tx equal to w. This we use the fact that t is surjective, right? And then we have with this x, t bar of x plus kernel of t. We give tx, we give you w. So for any w, there's a function from this space such that t bar of this gives you w. So it is surjective. So here we really use the fact that t is surjective to show that t bar is surjective. And for injective, injectivity, the zero vector in this quotient space is zero plus kernel of t, which is kernel of t itself, the set itself. Now for any z and the kernel of t bar, if we can show that if we can show that kernel of t bar is equal to kernel t, then we're good, right? So for any z in kernel t, it's equal to something like this. So t bar on the z gives you tz, right? Which gives you 0w because, because, um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, because you're in the kernel of t bar, so this gives should give you zero on w. But t is equal to zero w, which means that z is the kernel of t, which means that we have this equality. So z is equal to kernel of t. So we show that it's injective and it's surjective. And notice that t bar of pi x is t bar of x of t is tx. So this is like really trivial to see that, okay? So we have to show some invertibility of linear maps, some fancy notations, some diagrams, some standard representation. We talked about some function that is only only left invertible, right? Some function that's only left invertible but not invertible because it is not subjective. And something is fantastic under finite dimensional setting, but an infinite dimensional story gets a bit weird, gets a bit different, right? And we already have a fundamental fundamental view of linear spaces. I mean, vector spaces is that all finite dimensional spaces, they only differ by dimensions, right? Because if they have the same dimensions, if they have the same dimension, then they're isomorphic. Okay. So this is, in, in my opinion, my favorite part, right? So I'll see you guys next time.